In this video, I'd like to discuss the intersection of culture and communication and the impact that uh, culture has on communication in general and the way we communicate and relate to other people. So let's start off with a definition of culture. What is it that we mean when we say culture? Uh, what well, culture is the following things. It is learned and shared specifically. It is something that we learn and share. It's not something we're born with necessarily or born into. It is something that we learn over time and then we share with those around us and the generations that follow us. Uh, culture is also uh, affiliated with symbols, language, values, and norms. It's, it it's, consists of these things, shared symbols, language, values, and norms. Um, again, that we learn from others and that we share with others then and spread our culture in that way. So, so uh, we learn and share these things, these symbols, language, values, and norms. Uh, culture is also how we distinguish one group of people from another. It's how we kind of um, separate um, ourselves or, or define, you know, who is part of us and who's part of not. And, and we use the terminology to in defining the, that group of people from another, we, we use the terminology in groups, as in us, anything we would say us that we are a part of would be what we call an in group, and then anything that where we would say them, in other words, we are not included in this in this uh, area or this circle, so to speak, uh, would be an out group. Okay, so out groups are them, in groups are us. Uh, we do need to be cautious when we're talking about culture that we, we need to avoid ethnocentrism, which is this idea that our culture is inherently superior to other cultures. When we talk about culture, we want to focus specifically on different than, not better than or worse than, right? Our culture is not necessarily better than or worse than another culture. It, it's just different from that culture, okay? But when we get into that trap of, when we, get, when we fall in that trap of ethnocentrism, uh, we get into that mindset of, um, our culture is inherently superior to yours. Okay? And so just as a funny example, sometimes we, we, we have this map that, you know, some, sometimes we say Americans see the world through the lens of an American, right? So we, we tend to see the world as centered around us. We're the center of the universe and everything else is, is kind of there to serve us and to serve our purpose because our culture is obviously so much better. And so we get this ethnocentric view where everything else is, is either weird or bad or it in some way serves us in some way. Um, these other cultures do so. That's what we want to avoid, this ethnocentrism. Now, I do want to point out, though, uh, this is a map that you're probably familiar with, right? a map that you've seen a lot. This is this is a standard map. It's called the uh, Mercator map, uh, uh, Mercator projection map of the, of the world. And so this is a map, if you grew up in the United States, you probably grew up with this map. Okay, that you're, you, this is what's familiar to you. And, and I hate to burst your bubble, and you're probably thinking, why is he showing us a map? I hate to burst your bubble, because this map is actually incorrect. It is not factual. It is not representative of things as they are in proportion in the world. It doesn't represent, proportionally speaking, the accurate size of nations and of, uh, of areas, right? So I want you to fix this in your mind. Fix this map in your mind real quick. Uh, set it really good in there, and then I'm going to show you another map. Okay, so this is the Mercator projection map. I want to show you the Peters projection map. This is what's called the Peters projection map, which is an updated map. The Mercator projection map is, is you know, hundreds of years old now, but the Peters projection map is a more recent map, and it's also not ethnocentric. The Mercator map is very ethnocentric. It puts Europe right at the center of everything and enlarges the size of Europe because it was developed uh, in, in Europe. But this is a, and it minimizes these other countries. Look how, look how much bigger Africa is than it was in that other map, right? The Peter's projection map accurately represents, though, the size of these masses, these land masses, in proportion. And to give you a side-by-side -side comparison here, you have the, the, again, the Peter's projection map on your left, Mercator map on the right. You can see just how different these are and how, you know, sort of inaccurate the Mercator projection map is. But that's the one we're used to. That's the one we go with because, in some ways, and it was developed in this way because that's the one that emphasizes the, at the time, the quote-unquote superior cultures or the most important cultures of Western Europe and uh, and, of, and of Russia and of uh, the United States and and minimizes these other places, right? These the places that are considered, at that time, would have been considered less than, like Africa and South America. that didn't have as much to offer, right? So they, they were ended up being much smaller in this map. The Peters projection map has the appropriate proportional size and is not an ethnogra uh, ethnocentric view of the world as such. Okay? And if you really want to have your mind blown, some people would say that, uh, some people have said that, uh, that, 
really the way the map is represented even still, even with the Peter's projection map, it, it places you know a group of people on the bottom of the world that don't necessarily belong there. And, and that could be something that they see as, you know, we're less than because we're below. So they say, some people would say that we need to, what we need to do is use the Peter's projection map, but also flip it upside down. What's that doing to your mind right now, right? How's that affecting you uh, to see the world uh, upside down like that? Um, and so, I mean, there's no reason we couldn't do this, of course, you know, and, uh, and uh, they would say that those, those people then in those areas may, uh, may raise their esteem being on the top of the world instead of always being at the bottom of the world. But anyway, that we'll leave that up to, uh, to larger bodies and larger minds than ours. Okay. But, uh, we need to avoid that kind of ethnocentrism and get out of that mindset. The last thing we want to def in defining culture I want to talk about is that culture is not the same as ethnicity, race, or nationality. Culture will oftentimes follow those things, right? People who, with a shared ethnicity or shared race or shared nationality will oftentimes share a culture, but those are not things that, that necessarily define culture. Again, culture is defined by symbols, language, values, and norms. And now, while there's a lot of intersection a lot of times there, um, you know, you were born into an ethnicity or a race or really a nationality too. And as we discussed earlier, culture is learned and shared. It's not something you're born into. So that's why it's, it's technically not a part of those things. Although, again, there tends to be a lot of intersection, tends to follow those things a lot, but, uh, but they're not the same thing. When we talk about culture, we're not talking explicitly about ethnicity, race, or nationality. So as we already talked about the uh, the components of U.S. culture, for example, we're going to dig in a little bit and define this so we can understand a little more. Uh, as, I want to show you some representations of U.S. culture. And if we do that, I want you to remember that, again, the components of culture in general are symbols, language, values, and norms. So let's take a look at some of the different components of those items that make up U.S. culture. So first uh, first things first, we talk about symbols. Culture is, is made up of a shared uh, understanding a group of symbols, right? So here we have some symbols that would be important, right? So a uh, little joke. Those are those are different. That's a different kind of symbol, right? But symbols here in the United States that would be considered uh, important for our culture or representative of our culture would be the flag, of course. That's very represent. I mean, you know, represents the ideals of America and and is important to America. It's a very symbolic representation of the United States. Things like the bald eagle as well, the Statue of Liberty, those are all symbols of, of you know, the United States, uh, apple pie and baseball, right? Those are, those are, and then you have the flag thrown in there as well. Those are, you know, when we say as American as apple pie, right? That, that's what we mean. That, it's a symbolic of the things that, that the United States represents, right? These, these ideals that the United States represents. So, so we have the shared culture through these symbols. Another part of culture is language, and as we know, we don't have an official language in the United States, but for the most part, we speak English in the United States, right? Now, there, there, we have people from all over the world here in the U.S., and there are lots of languages that are languages that are spoken, but the most common language here in the United States, the one that is considered kind of, you know, representative of our culture, is English, right? As far as values, things that we value here in the United States, ideas that we value, we value things like liberty and freedom, right? We value our liberty and, and our autonomy as, as individuals. We value uh, justice. This is lady justice, right? We, we value that, that kind of uh, fairness and equality and justice. Uh, we, 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 theoretically, we, uh, we, we value equality and espouse that every every person is equality is, is equal right that's as stated in the in the constitution right that all men are created equal and uh, and and in modern language you know all people are created equal right so we we value equality we value honesty in the united states brutal honesty almost right we don't we don't co we don't sugarcoat things we don't beat around the bush we value that kind of honesty here in the united states um, so uh, and and forthrightness and and I don't you know so anyway uh, so what are some of the norms so we we've talked about symbols we talked about language and we talked about values those are three to four and the fourth category of of what makes up a culture are norms so uh, some of the norms we have in the United States include these norms right norm from Cheers and Norm Macdonald if you're old enough to remember those uh, you may get that joke but if not then uh, our norms also include things like driving on the right side of the road. Whereas in other parts of the world, they drive on the opposite side. They drive on the left side of the road, uh, but we drive on the right side of the road. Uh, our norm here is, you know, the, 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 the parents with 2.5 kids and, you know, and the dog and the big yard and things like that. Whereas in other cultures, 
um, the, the family size may be larger or smaller, and their, their living spaces may be very, very different, may, may or may not include a yard and things like that, right? But here we value, and, and the norm here is for, you know, those types of things. The norm here is we, you know, we eat lots of meat, we, we grill out, we eat meat, and that's acceptable here. Again, they're obviously vegetarian and vegan uh, folks here, but, but, you know, in other cultures, this would be you know, the fact that we eat hamburger. That we eat, that we eat cows and things would be very different for them, uh, and just like it is in other cultures that that eat um, that may eat horse or, or or dog meat or something like that that would be strange to us or different for us. Um, this is a norm for us uh, that our uh, norm that our meat comes from from cows and and uh, and pigs and things like that. The norm for us are these you know four major sports: basketball, baseball, football, and and hockey, I know soccer's coming on here, but uh, but these are these are the norms for us, as opposed to a lot of the other world where soccer is just. I mean, people are fanatic about fanatical about soccer in other parts of the world, right? Or cricket, uh, things like that. That the, the people, different sports, people enjoy, but the norms for us involve these types of sports. So, so those are the components of culture. Okay, just to, again, just a representation. Those specifically were for U.S. culture, the representative of, of the culture here in the United States, but. Whatever culture you're in has symbols, language, values, and norms. So how does culture affect communication? Well, there are a variety of ways, and just to touch on some of these quickly here. Um, first, we have low and high context cultures. Low and high context cultures. So low context cultures, like the United States and like uh, individualized cultures around the world, uh, United States, Western Europe, Australia, Canada, places like that, or what we call low context culture, which means we place a, a premium and a really high emphasis on the words that are spoken, we assume that, that the language people choose is representative of what they feel, and we, we don't seek much beyond that language unless it's really obvious to us. In high context cultures, they tend to look beyond the language. They, they pay more attention to nonverbals. They pay more attention to context in general. Places like Eastern Asia, in, in Africa, in South America are more high context cultures looking at not just the language but the overall package. Okay? Whereas in the United States we tend to be more direct with our language and so we depend more on that verbal uh, verbal communication and, and, and the meaning behind that. Individualism versus collectivism. Again, the United States is very individualistic um, as are you know, Western Europe, um, Australia, Israel is very individualistic, meaning that uh, that we are more interested in how this impacts me. We tend to be more focused on how this impacts me and those directly around me. What impact is this going to have on me? And then also, you know, what do I need in terms of getting ahead? How, how do I get ahead in these things? How do I make an impact for myself and reap the rewards for myself? As opposed to collectivism, where, where it's more about how does this affect the entire group? How does my behavior affect everyone else? I don't want to, you know, cause too many ripples on the pond. I don't want to upset the fruit basket, so to speak. So I'm going to make the decision that's best for us as a group. And uh, and there's a lot of historical uh, context behind all this that, and how it developed. But, uh, but we see collectivistic cultures, again, in places like Eastern Asia, Africa, South America, as opposed to individualistic cultures in the United States and Western Europe and places like that. Uh, low and high power distance cultures has to do with how we treat power in general. The United States is a very low power distance culture, meaning um, we consider uh, no one really to be above anybody else in the sense that you, your future is what you make it. You can get as far as you can achieve, right? And uh, and so um, if we don't, you know, just put somebody up on a pedestal and say, well, you rule my life now, right? uh, as opposed to high power distance cultures where they have a much different relationship with with people in power. And with that power, and, and, and those power relationships tend to uh, be more stable and stay the same. You're not really going to move from wherever you're at right now. Uncertainty avoidance. Some cultures are more comfortable with uncertainty and uh, am ambiguity. In the United States, we're not so much. So uh, achievement versus nurturing. The United States, not surprisingly, very achievement-oriented culture as opposed to nurturing um, although we're, we're kind of shifting, you know, into an everybody gets a trophy type culture, so that's kind of changing a little bit. Monochronic and polychronic have to do with our relationship with time and how we view time. In the United States, we're very monochronic. Time is money. We have very specific, you know, start times and end times for things, as opposed to other cultures where it's a little more fluid. So this is just scratching the surface of culture, really. If you have questions about culture and, and or, or anything related to that, please don't hesitate to email me. I'd love to have a further dialogue with you about that. Uh, in the meantime, just remember that culture really, 
lays over and is part of the framework for every other part of communication. So consider it at the forefront of your mind.